Welcome back to GCC Kids Connection, where we are connecting with each other while you're home from school, we're connecting with some really cool books, and most importantly, we're connecting with God's Word. We're so glad you're here. Well, welcome back, kids. Wow, things have really kind of gotten exciting in Fuzzle's world. He's met some friends, he's learned about his new secret weapon that he has, and now, thanks to Skitter the Squirrel, he's been saved from a flood. So let's find out now what happens with Fuzzle and the other forest animals as a result of this flood that's come through their forest. Chapter 13 in New Kid in Town. I slept through the rest of the day, and when I awoke, the rain had stopped. I could hardly wait to find out how my log home had fared. As fast as I was able, I hurried toward it. Now that the sun was down and the moon peeked occasionally through the scattered clouds, it was easy to find my bearings. The squirrels had all gone to bed, so I wasn't able to find out from any of them the news of the woods. I was sure that the heavy rain and the flooding creek had caused no harm to the squirrel's home because they live so high in the trees. I did wonder, though, about my other friends, but I could think of none of them that really lived close to the creek bed near me. When I reached my part of the woods, I could scarcely believe my eyes. The area where my log was located was completely underwater. It certainly was a good thing that Skitter and his friends had called me out of my sleep, or I might be underwater too. I felt a little sick inside about my home. How long would it be before the creek receded again and I'd be able to move back to my log? I knew that I would need to take all of my bedding out and replace it with dry leaves and moss. Everything in the log would be soaked. I hoped it would be not be too long before it got all dried out. I missed my home. With a deep sigh, I turned from the scene before me and headed for the pond. On my way, I met two bush rabbits. Mindy and Mandy were twin daughters of Mrs. R. Rabbit. <laughs> there were so many rabbits in the woods that they went alphabetically. Mindy called out that she, when she saw me, Fuzzle, we were worried about you when we heard the creek was flooded again. I'm fine, I hastened to assure her. Skitter and his family and friends came to wake me up. And how is your home? Oh, it's still underwater, I said dejectedly. I just came from looking at it. It may be a number of days until it's dry enough for me to move back in. The twin rabbits looked at each other but said nothing. Did anyone else have any trouble, I asked. We haven't seen anybody yet. We just got up. We're on our way to the pond now. So we walked to the pond together. The path was still wet and the trees and grasses were dripping. I wonders, wondered as I trudged along on our, in our woods, would it ever be dry again? When we arrived at the pond, things were in a real commotion. We could hear the uproar because, before we could actually see it. When we did round the bend in the path and beheld the scene before us, we just all gasped. Never had we seen the pond as it was at the present. It was twice as big as normal. Water seemed to be everywhere. There was a great deal of hurrying and scurrying, and at first I could not understand what all the commotion was about. Then I realized that it was the beavers who were in such a panic. What happened? I asked a nearby coon as I answer, entered the entrance to the, uh, to the pond. The flooding washed away part of the beaver dam. They're hurrying up to repair the damage. I could now see the problem once he had pointed it out. Five beavers seemed to be everywhere. Two were carrying large limbs of trees in their mouths and steering them through the water to the rift in the dam. The other three were busy up on the dam, pushing and patting logs, limbs, and mud into place. It looked like a big job to me, and I knew that I wouldn't have the first idea to know where to start. Can they do it? I asked the coon. <laughs> you better hope they can, he replied. Every animal in this forest counts on the pond in one way or the, uh, the, in one way or the other. If we lose it, we're all in trouble. You mean we could lose the pond if the beavers don't get the dam fixed? The pond is here because of the beaver dam. The water comes from two sources, that nearby creek bed, when it rains enough, and the small creek that feeds on the other side. 
The creek only flows heavily when we have hard rains and the water drains in from the nearby hills. The other creek has been dangerously near drying up many times. If the beavers hadn't built the dam and filled up this pond at times, we would have gone without water. We all need the dam and we need it badly. Well, I said, wondering how all the rest of the creatures could just stand around and watch while the beavers did all the work. Why don't we give them a hand, I said. Us? Nothing we can do. None of us knows how to build a dam. They could show us. They're too busy with the building to be working with us. We just better stay out of their way. It seemed a shame to me to leave all the hard work to the poor beavers. I did wish that there was some way that we could help them out. As the night went on, more and more creatures gathered on the banks of the pond. There was very little talking, for we feared that even our muted conversation might in some way hamper the, the beavers hard at work. Besides, I think that there were those in our number who were afraid of the consequences if the beavers weren't able to stop the flow. It was near morning before a shout went up from the waiting crowd. I think that the first victory call came from the beaver in the form of a slap of his tail onto the water. Another beaver echoed the splash and then another. At first, I thought that something was dreadfully wrong, knowing that a splash from a beaver's big flat tail was normally a distress single signal. I was relieved to learn that in this case, it was just the beavers celebrating. They had managed to rebuild the dam. It was holding in the flowing water again. As soon as the good news reached the shore, many shouts of victory were heard with screeches, cries, grunts, stomping of feet, and any other means of expressing our joy. After the uproar had settled down somewhat, the animals began to stir themselves and chatter as usual. It wasn't until then that I realized that I ached all over from standing still for such a long time. The other creatures must have felt it too, for I saw many of them stretching and flexing unused muscles in an effort to get the kinks out. We animals were not used to remaining perfectly still for such a long period of time. It was then too that I discovered how hungry I was. I had gone to bed dissatisfied that morning and now it was almost time for the sun to come up again. The other animals must have discovered the same thing, for we all began to scatter immediately, knowing that we had very little time to eat before we slept. I hurried off to the picnic site. Hmm, it was disappointing. There were very few edibles in the barrels. It seemed that the rain had kept the barrels from being filled up as usual. I did manage to find a leftover mouthful of apple core or soggy potato chip here and there upon the ground, but soon gave up and went on to hunt elsewhere. I traveled the path to the meadow slowly, finding a cricket or some night crawler as I went. When I reached the meadow, I found that the rain had affected it too. All the lower spots were just little ponds now. The tall grasses were no longer standing up tall, but seemed to be bent over toward the ground, trying to stand up under the weight of the water. Forest creatures stirred. Mrs. Deer and Cassandra were there. Cassandra called a greeting to me as soon as she spotted me, and Mrs. Deer stopped feeding long enough to inquire about my home. I assured her that it would be fine once the creek waters washed by. An owl swooped over our heads. He landed in a tree nearby and surveyed the world. It looked like his breakfast had been postponed as well because of all the rains. I moved on, poking at a stone here and there and an ant hill every now and then. Finally, I decided to just give up and go home. Home? Uh-oh, I didn't even have a home. Where would I go until my the creek revealed my log again? I remembered the fallen tree and the house of sorts under the branches and the roots. I headed for it. It certainly wasn't comfortable like my home, but at least it was a place to hide and stay away from the wet and sleep. When I reached it, I checked it very carefully before I entered to make sure that no other animal had occupied it. Then I went in and tried to make myself comfortable. There was no softness about this place. I didn't wonder that no other animal had chosen it. It didn't feel like home at all. I curled up in a tight, uncomfortable ball and told myself to go to sleep. Hopefully by the next rising of the sun, I would be back in my own home where I belonged. 
I was glad to leave my makeshift home that evening and shake loose some of my stiff muscles. My leafless bed did not suit me at all. I was hungry too, and so I headed quickly for the pond. Here I found things pretty much back to normal. The beavers had done a good job on the dam, and the danger of losing our much-needed water supply was past, at least for the present. The frogs croaked, the raccoons dined, and the beavers and muskrats swam busily about. Nearby, an owl hooted loudly. A fish left a silver arc as it dived into the air for a split second. I felt that my world had been restored to its proper order. After having a refreshing drink, I hurried off to the picnic site. It was disappointing. There were very few edibles in the barrels. It seemed that the rain had kept the barrels from being filled up as usual. I did manage to find a left-behind mouthful of apple core or a soggy potato chip here and there scattered on the ground, but I soon gave up and knew that I must do some hunting elsewhere. I traveled the path to the meadow slowly, finding a cricket or some night crawlers here and there. When I reached the meadow, I found that the rain had affected it too. All of the lower spots were little ponds, and the tall grasses were no longer standing, but seemed to be flat upon the ground, too tired to stand up and hold the weight of the water. Forest creatures stirred. Mrs. Deer and Cassandra were there. Cassandra called a greeting to me as soon as she spotted me, and Mrs. Deer stopped feeding long enough to inquire about my home. I assured her that it would be fine once the creek waters had washed on by. An owl swooped over our heads. He landed in a tree nearby and surveyed the world. It looked like his breakfast had been postponed too. I moved on, poking at a stone here and there or an anthill. Finally, I just decided to give up and go home. Home? I didn't even have a home. Where would I go until the creek gave my log back? I remembered that fallen tree and the house of sorts under the branches and roots. I headed for it. It certainly wasn't very comfortable like my home, but at least it was a place to hide away and sleep. When I reached it, I checked, out, checked it out carefully before I entered to make sure that no other animal had already occupied it. Then I went in and tried to make myself comfortable. There was no softness about this place. I didn't wonder that no other animal had chosen it. It didn't feel like home at all. I curled up in a tight, uncomfortable ball and told myself to go to sleep. Hopefully, by the next rising of the sun, I would be back in my own home where I belonged. I was glad to leave my makeshift home that evening and shake loose some of my stiff muscles. My leafless bed did not suit me at all. I was hungry too, and so I headed quickly to the pond. Here I found things back to normal. The beavers had done a good job on the dam and the danger of losing our much needed water supply was past, at least for now. The frogs croaked, the raccoons dined, and the beavers and muskrats swam busily about. Nearby, an owl hooted loudly. A fish left a silver arc as it dived into the air for a split second. I felt that my world had been restored to proper order. After having a refreshing drink, I left for the picnic area. I hoped that it had been restored to its proper order too, and that there would once again be a quality and quantity of things to eat. During the rain, the picnickers had the picnic inn had been very slant, scant indeed. There was not an abundance of food in the barrels, but I did manage to find enough to satisfy my immediate needs. I started for the meadow, thinking that I would add a few crickets and other tasty things to my menu before the sun came up. The meadow, too, was filled with activity. Mrs. Deer and Cassandra were daintily picking their way across the shadowed sides of the small area, feeding upon the grasses as they went. Three members of the rabbit family played tag or leapfrog or perhaps some strange combination of the two. It seemed to have different rules from any other game I had ever watched before. They seemed to be enjoying it immensely. I stood and watched them for a while. They called to me to come join them, but I knew better than to try. My legs were just not very good at leaping. When I moved on, looking for something edible as I made my way across the meadow, I was surprised by a squeaky voice calling to my name. I looked up quickly and saw Cuddles approaching. I hastened to meet him, grinning as I did so. Hi, Cuddles! Hi, Fuzzles! He said all out of breath. What brings you to the meadow? 
Well, he said squeakily, I heard that the creek flooded again, and you said that you lived down that way, so I came to see. I'm fine. My log did get flooded, though. I'm sleeping in a temporary place until it dries up again. I sure will be glad to have my home back, though. Cuddles nodded as though he understood. Well, he said, I'm glad that you're okay. Our talk turned to other things then. I told Cuddles all about our pond and the beaver's fast work to fix the dam. He told me about the heavy rains and how it had concerned some of the animals in the pine forest. They had been worried that the storm would bring lightning and start a forest fire. The forest was very dry because of the long spell without moisture. The neighborhood animals felt much safer now after the heavy rainfall and were actually very thankful for the rain that had almost flooded me out and threatened my life. We were glad that no real harm had come to anyone during the storm. Actually, the storm brought a lot of good. We took an ambling walk down to the pond to check things out. It was still higher than normal, but the beaver dam actually regulated the flow of water very nicely. The area in the pine forest was further down the stream from the pond, so the animals who lived there could be assured a future water supply as well. I better be getting, said Cuddles in his squeaky voice. I don't travel very fast, and it's quite a ways back to my part of the forest. I sure do thank you for coming over. It's really been good to see you again, I assured him. If you knew, if I knew where to find you, I'd come see you sometime. Well, maybe some night when we have time, I'll come over and we can walk back together. I'd love to show you my part of the woods and introduce you to some of my friends and family. Do you have family, I asked him. Well, no, not real, really, <laughs> not like the rabbits. <laughs> it seemed that no matter where you go in the woods, you can find rabbits. We aren't too many in number. We sort of scatter after we grow up. We don't get together very often, I'm afraid. I do have a sister, though, who lives not too far away, and we see each other fairly frequently. She keeps in touch with my mother, who sees my oldest brother, who passes word on to my youngest brother. So we sort of keep in touch in a roundabout way. I suddenly felt very sad. I didn't even have a sister nearby, and I had no idea where my mother was or the rest of my family. I allowed myself, for the first time in weeks, to wonder if I'd ever find them again. I must be a very long, long way from the woods where I had been born. Cuddles began to talk about when we could get together again, and the feeling of loneliness soon left me. I'm going to need to clean out my log home and get it dried and relined with leaves and mosses, I told him. I hope it won't be too long before the water goes down and I'm able to do that. After that, I could come over any time. Good, he squeaked. I'll give you a few more days and then I'll check up on you again. Great, I said. I'll see you then. He left and headed back down the path toward my temporary home. Finally, we were beyond calling distance. I hadn't gone far when I met Flossie and Mitten's rabbit. They were both looking well fed and plump. I didn't tell them so, but I thought that they were actually getting a little bit on the tubby side. Hi, Fuzzle, they said in unison, and then they both giggled. <laughs> I didn't care much for their giggling, but I did answer them politely. Are you living over here now, Mittens asked. Ah, oh, just for a few more days, I replied. Then where are you going, asked Flossie. Back home to my log. They both looked surprised at that, and I wondered why, but I didn't ask. Flossie changed the subject. Boy, did you have any good thing to eat tonight? She started patting her, or we had some good things to eat tonight. She said, patting her bulging sides, and Mitten giggled again. I felt like saying, uh, yes, I noticed, <laughs> but instead I just said, where? Well, started Flossie, rolling her eyes. We aren't supposed to, Mama says, but we went to the garden patch of Mrs. Canning. Her name's not Canning, silly, said Mittens. That's just what she does. Her name is Peters. The rabbits both laughed until I was fearful that their well-fed sides might pop. At last, Mittens seemed to get control of herself. Do you like garden stuff, she asked me. Oh, he probably doesn't, 
cut in Flossie. He likes crickets and frogs and things. Oh, oh, but I do, I hasten to inform her. I like many things. I remember visiting a garden with my family and we found all kinds of good things there. I especially like strawberries. Mrs. Peters doesn't have any strawberries, said Flossie. <laughs> Mrs. Canning teased Mittens and they started to howl with laughter again. As soon as I felt that it was polite to do so, I excused myself and said goodbye, leaving them still rolling on the ground, holding their shaking sides. When I, I approached my makeshift abode, I told myself that I really should carry some moss and leaves to make this a softer bed, but I reminded myself that I might not be here very long. Besides, I was very tired from my long night of feeding and visiting. The sun would be up soon, and I wanted nothing more than to settle down and go to sleep, so I didn't bother. I crawled into the dark, damp hole beneath the fallen tree and curled up as comf comfortably as I could, and I was soon sound asleep. So, um, Cuddles is still in his temporary home. He had a visit from Cuddles, which was very nice. For our activity sheet today, again, we have some really good thinking questions. Um, here's one that says, why do you think the rabbits, Mittens and Flossie, looked at one another and rolled their eyes when Fuzzle said that he would soon be moving back into his old log house? Wonder why they did that. Think about it. Then um, down here in advice for Fuzzle, it says Cuddles showed that he really cared for his friend Fuzzle by making a special trip to see if he was okay. Look up some Bible verses that you could share with Fuzzle about caring for one another. And then down at the bottom, some science questions. Find out some facts about beavers and what is a beaver dam? because that was very important in our story today. So have fun with your questions about Fuzzle, and we'll see you next time to find out what's gonna happen next. Bye-bye.